All right. Um, okay, so welcome to this talk on the BA history at St Mary's University. Uh, who are you listening to? Who's talking to you? Well, my name is Stuart McCain and I'm the Programme Director in History at St Mary's University. Um, I have my colleague here, I'll let Mark introduce himself. Uh, hello everyone, if you can hear me, my name is Mark Donnelly and uh, as it says there, I teach history alongside Stuart um, at St Mary's and I'll talk a little bit later about one of the, the modules that I deliver. Great, so as Mark said, I'm gonna, we're going to do this in two, two parts. So I'm going to start just by giving you a little bit of an introduction to what studying history at St Mary's is like, a bit of information about the department. Um, and then Mark is going to talk a little bit about some of the material that he works with um, with students on the programme. So, as you know, St Mary's University is, is very close to Richmond upon Thames uh, College, so I probably don't need to tell you too much about uh, the campus or the location. Um, you can go and have a, a look around our campus, it's really, really lovely. Um, as you can see, it's kind of uh, quite, quite beautiful. Um, it is attached to its own historic house, Strawberry Hill House, uh, which is always interesting for students who are studying history at St Mary's. Um, they have the opportunity to do work placements there. And the area itself is really good for um, studying history. There's loads of interesting historic uh, locations, most of which you've probably been to, have had a nose round. Uh, so Hampton Court here, it's a good example of that down at the left-hand corner. And we are also very close to central London. So I suppose it's worth starting um, with this question, why study history? At university? Well, firstly, I think it's quite an exciting subject to study. Um, it is a, an opportunity to think about different societies and cultures in different parts of the world um, and in different periods of time. So a chance to really think about how people in different contexts have, have thought a, a, and acted. Um, and it's also useful in a really wide range of careers. So just to kind of give you a, a little bit of a, an illustration of this, uh, there's some research done very recently by the British Academy on um, you know, the, the impact of arts, humanities and social science graduates in the workforce. And they found that a really, really large number of, of leaders in lots of different fields had degrees in arts and humanities and social science backgrounds, so subjects like history, English, languages, sociology. Um, so 55% of global leaders had a, a degree in those subjects. 62% of candidates at UK general elections. Um, you can decide whether or not it's a good thing that most politicians have degrees in this subject or not. Uh, and 58% of FTSE 100 chief executives. So 58% of the people who run the biggest, the 100 biggest companies in the country. Uh, so I think this is worth thinking about um, in the context of all of the discussion which takes place around the, the usefulness of degrees like history in the workplace. Uh, when you actually look at what people who study those degrees go on to do, it sort of seems that the suggestion that they don't set you up for a really good career or they're, they're not sort of um, sufficiently applied or vocational isn't quite right. Uh, students who study history go on to be really successful in a whole range of different things. What can I say about the department at St Mary's? Well, it's worth saying that we are focused on teaching, we're focused on students. Uh, and I think largely as a result of that, we've had some really, really good results in the what's called the National Student Survey. So that's a survey of all final year undergraduates as they come towards the end of their studies. So in their third year, they're asked across the country, no matter what subject they're studying, what university, what did you think about your experience as a student? Um, and in the last of those exercises in 2020, uh, we got 100% student satisfaction. So 100% of our students said they were satisfied overall with the course. 
Um, and we've also had some really good recognition in terms of the quality of teaching and learning in the department. So the Times Good University Guide in 2019 ranked as number one in London for teaching and learning. I think part of this is about how we teach. So we use a lot of friendly seminar style teaching. Um, some institutions you'll turn up and you will be at the back of a, a lecture theatre with 150, 200 students listening to someone like me talk about history. Uh, we don't have any large lectures like that. Most of our seminar groups are 10, 15, 20 students in size. Uh, and that means that you get a really good chance to talk in detail about a subject with the seminar leader, with your fellow classmates. So rather than just kind of sitting and listening, you get the chance to, to discuss um, and to really explore uh, the a subject in detail. We are all subject experts um, and we have tried to make sure that this is reflected uh, in the kinds of things that we teach. Um, so for example one of our colleagues Glenn Richardson um, is an expert on the Tudor period um, and he has written a book about the field of the cloth of gold so um, the kind of the big meeting uh, between Henry VIII and the King of France um, and he teaches a lot about kind of Renaissance kingship um, and the Tudor period so you know he can really speak with expertise about that. I have another colleague Claire Norton who's written a lot about the Ottomans um, and explores that uh, in, in great detail uh, in the special course she teaches on that. Uh, and Mark, of course, is uh, an expert in uh, public history um, and understanding the role of history in contemporary society. Uh, and as you'll see a bit later, that really informs quite a lot of the work that he does on the degree. Um, and as I said, history really does lead on to a very wide range of different possible careers. So our graduates uh, from St Mary's have gone on to work um, in fields such as teaching, uh, museums and heritage. Uh, we've had people go into law, into finance. So it's a really, really good range of different options that students can take uh, once they've completed their degree. Um, in addition, lots of our students choose to go on to further study, whether with us um, studying on our MA in public history um, or studying other subjects elsewhere. So that's one of the things that a history degree can give you is, is a lot of options. One of the other things it's worth saying about our degree is you do have the opportunity to do a work placement um, as part of your course. Um, and you shouldn't think of this in the same way as maybe your kind of work experience at school where you kind of turn up for a week and, you know, just really observe people. We have students who go and do genuine project work with organisations around um, Richmond and in, in London. Uh, and that includes heritage organisations. So I've got an example here, which is Turner's House. Um, that's the house of the, the painter, uh, JMW Turner. Uh, and we had a student fairly recently who went there and helped them produce a series of educational packs for students. So she kind of designed and put together the kinds of things that schools use when they take students to visit. Um, we've also had students go and do work placements in schools um, and in other fields related to history. But that's a really, really good opportunity to do some kind of meaningful work with a local organisation um, and develop some really good kind of understanding of how those organisations work. Uh, we also have a whole range of study abroad opportunities um, and our students, this is really popular with our students actually. Um, so we have had a couple of students go off to San Francisco uh, up here, which uh, I think is a lovely place to go. And, um, you know, I think they were slightly reluctant to come back to Richmond to, to Twickenham in the end. Um, we have had students go off to Australia and to Sydney their study abroad. Uh, at the moment we've got a student in Washington. So this is a really, really good chance to see how things are done in other parts of the world. And we actually have 
really, really strong links with uh, universities in North America, um, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so that's a, a kind of a really good opportunity that you can take advantage of as a student at St Mary's. I think it's worth saying a little bit about what our degree looks like. So what kind of things you'll be studying as a student at St Mary's. So in the first year, we start off with a series of courses which are designed to get you thinking about history in kind of different ways. Uh, so maybe thinking about topics you haven't had a chance to study at school um, or looking at those topics that you have studied, but in greater detail uh, and thinking about the sort of different interpretations that historians uh, have offered about them. Um, so first, first semester you have a module called Doing History, which Mark convenes and is very much about thinking about the nature of history as a, as a discipline. Um, and then you also study modules on war and society, transatlantic histories of slavery, um, the Mediterranean world, art and power. So looking at how uh, art and visual culture has, has shaped politics and society over time uh, and revolutions and rebellions. So all of these, um, generally speaking, take on a, a large period of time. So to take the example of war and society, that runs from the 16th century, looking at the kind of origins of modern warfare in the military revolution, um, up to the end of the, of the Second World War. Uh, similarly, art and power runs from the Renaissance period, looking at kind of images of Renaissance monarchs, uh, like Elizabeth I, um, through to present day contexts such as uh, graffiti uh, in Palestine or the, the wall murals in Northern Ireland where uh, nationalist and unionist communities uh, paint images uh, that kind of serve as uh, kind of political propaganda really. In the second year, you have uh, a series of options which tend to allow you to shape your, your study a little bit more. So we have a core module called Public Histories. I'm not gonna to say too much about that because Mark's gonna tell you a little bit about that module in a moment. Um, but then we have a series of modules that run from the Hundred Years War all the way through to you know, the 1960s and contemporary issues around race and ethnicity in the US. Um, and the idea really is that you have the chance to study a really, really different or wide range of different geographical locations. So think about uh, different societies uh, across the world uh, and different historical periods. So you know, from the, the, the medieval period, with the Hundred Years War, through to the contemporary period. Uh, this is also the time uh, with the module Making History Work, uh, that you have the opportunity to explore some work experience um, and really get to grips with especially how history works um, in the kind of world outside of education. So what does history mean in these different contexts? Um, how do heritage organisations, educational organisations, other areas where historians go on to build careers, how do they function, what are they about? Um, this is also when, if you're thinking about doing that, most students go on their study abroad. The third year, um, again, is, is sort of structured around a series of different options which allow you to, sub to, to study a subject in depth. Um, set alongside uh, your dissertation. So your dissertation is the kind of pinnacle of your time at St Mary's. Uh, it's a chance for you to really devise and think about a subject that you're very, very interested in um, and go away and do sustained historical research on it. Um, and we're quite liberal in terms of the kind of topics that you can take. So you don't have to follow a topic that we've looked at in class, although you can do that. Um, you're, you're really free to think about the kind of thing that you're interested in. And provided there is a kind of enough primary material, you know, you can 
get your hands on uh, enough sources to, to write a good dissertation on the topic, um, you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, and I mean, we spend a lot of time working with our students to make sure that, you know, their ideas work and they can realize them. Uh, but it really is a chance to kind of show what you have learned in terms of understanding the past during your time studying history. Um, we've had some really, really great dissertations in the past from people looking at, you know, the reign of Henry VIII through to the way in which um, media reporting of race riots in Britain in the 1980s uh, kind of unfolded. So a really, really good range of, of different topics there. It's worth saying something about how we assess our programmes, I think. Um, so you will, as a, as a student at St Mary's, do a really, really wide range of different assessments. So you'll write essays, um, you'll do source analyses of, of primary sources, so thinking about how a particular source uh, can help us understand the, the past. Um, you'll do presentations, um, you'll do student exhibitions. Um, so, you know, producing, for example, a, a poster or a, um, a, an output of some kind, say an exhibition board or a, a video or a podcast that you can exhibit um, about a specific subject. Um, we also only have one exam on the program. Um, and I think that's, you know, really because by the time you get to university, you've sat a lot of exams. Um, we think it's important to give you a chance to show what you've learned in a whole range of different ways, rather than just sitting in an exam hall. So that's um, really all I was going to say in terms of a very brief overview of the course. Um, we'll, I'll give you our emails at the end so you can, if you like, get in contact with us with any questions that you do have. Um, but I think I'll hand over to my colleague Mark to say a little bit about kind of some of the content that we that we do that we that we study at St Mary's. Thank you very much, Stuart. Right, what I'm going to do then is share my screen. I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, about this subject. Rose must fall, um, and the broader subject that's contained in a post-colonial heritage. Um, as Stuart was mentioning before, um, I teach a number of modules at, at St Mary's. One of them in the middle year of the degree is on public histories. And this module really is about how accounts of the past and representations of the past and knowledge about the past sometimes gets mobilized um, in current political controversies and disputes and contests. And what we try to do is, is keep the module fairly up to date. So the kind of things that we talk about sort of reflect what's going on in the, in the news and the headlines. So uh, this year, for example, we did a few sessions on um, Israel-Palestine uh, and, uh, and the issues there, which is, you know, uh, in the news um, because of what was happening in, uh, in Gaza and the, the attacks from either side. Uh, we did a session on the whole Windrush scandal, which is still kind of reverberating pretty much now. Uh, we did something on Northern Ireland, uh, specifically Belfast and issues of political tourism in Belfast. Um, and we also um, thought back to the statues controversy of 2020, but rather than focus specifically on something like the Edward Colston statue, what we did is just take the story back slightly further and think about the roads must fall campaign um, in South Africa and also in Oxford. So just to give you an example of the kind of things that we talk about, is a picture here of uh, Cecil Rhodes, who was um, uh, an imperialist, an adventurer, politician, businessman, entrepreneur, part-time student at Oxford, um, went with his brother to um, kind of southern Africa um, in the kind of uh, later part of the 19th century, initially to grow cotton, um, but this was more or less the time when diamond deposits were discovered in South Africa and uh, Rhodes and his brother turned their attention towards that, became very, very successful. Cecil Rhodes was a very rich man by the time he was in his early 30s. He was a controversial figure. Um, he had, um, had views about British racial superiority. He had a vision for Africa under 
British colonial rule. Um, that cartoon there really depicts this. We have a cartoon of, of Cecil Rhodes striding the whole continent of Africa. That was his kind of vision of an Africa under the, under the dominion of, uh, of the British flag. Um, and he's been a controversial, well, he was a controversial figure at the time. Um, he had his critics. Um, he had people who took radically different views from him. And in the 20th and 21st century, he's continued to be a controversial figure. And the charges against Cecil Rhodes, the reason why he's a controversial figure, um, are partly because he forcibly expanded British imperialism across Southern Africa to get control of diamonds and other natural resources in the, in the 19th century. Uh, he turned ideas about race-based superiority, false ideas about race-based superiority, actually into practice using black African prisoners in mines and racially segregating his workforce. He was responsible for the deaths of indigenous peoples in Matabili land and other regions of current Zimbabwe, formerly Rhodesia, in the 1890s. Um, men, women and children, some were shot, some were hung, some were blown up in, uh, in places where they lived. Um, and also as prime minister of Cape Colony in the later 19th century, he laid the groundwork for South Africa's apartheid system, uh, which included limiting voting rights for black Africans and also racially segregating um, sports teams. Um, there was a cricket team that wanted to tour um, England from uh, what was then kind of um, uh, Cape Colony, eventually kind of becomes Rhodesia, and uh, Rhodes refused to allow uh, a black cricketer to, uh, to tour England. For all these reasons, uh, we can understand why some students of University Cape Town in South Africa objected to Cecil Rhodes being depicted, venerated in a statue. And this is a symbolic gesture of opposition um, to that statue, which really uh, ignites the Rhodes Must Fall campaign in the spring of 2015. Chimani Maxwelle throwing human excrement, human waste, at the, uh, the Cecil Rhodes statue at the University of Cape Town. That's in March. Um, the, the, the protests kind of gather pace and they gather strength uh, and more and more people join them. Um, they extend into occupying University of Cape Town buildings as a social media campaign against the, the presence of the Rhodes statue at UCT. And all of this gets caught up with wider issues of decolonizing the university, making sure that efforts are made to have uh, a more diverse student population at UCT, to have more diversity amongst the teaching staff and administrators at the university, and also to have a curriculum that isn't quite so Eurocentric, um, that has a kind of proper global representation of uh, writers, thinkers, stories and approaches. Within a month or so of um, the, uh, the Rose Must Fall campaign breaking out at UCT, the statue is removed. Uh, it's removed in April 2015 and similar protests follow in other South African universities, but also outside South Africa um, at, um, at Harvard and Princeton uh, in the US and in the UK at the universities of Oxford, Cambridge, UCL, SOAS, Queen Mary University in, uh, in East London, Sussex, and elsewhere. Putting down statues, by the way, um, it, it's, it's not, of course, uh, just a, a, a practice that's limited to statues of Cecil Rose. We can probably all think of fairly good examples of, of statues that have been removed from public display. Uh, if you're of a certain age, you're probably too young. Uh, if you're a student at Richmond upon Thames College, but if you're of a certain age, you, you may well remember the statue of Saddam Hussein being pulled down uh, in Baghdad shortly after um, the coalition forces uh, invaded there. Um, we could think about very many statues of Stalin from former Soviet um, kind of satellite states that were taken down and given back to um, given back to Moscow. There's a, there's a Moscow park that's full of old statues of Stalin that are no longer wanted in former kind of um, Soviet satellite states. Um, we could think about uh, a controversy recently 
uh, back in 2016 over this giant gold statue of Chairman Mao, Mao Zedong, in his, um, in his home province. Um, I guess this, this part reflects, I mean, this is part of the problem with managing the past, isn't it? And, and taking a stance on the past. The, the Chinese Communist Party has got fairly ambivalent views in some ways about Mao Zedong. Uh, as you'd expect, they're very supportive of the Mao Zedong of the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s. You know, in, in terms of a, an object of memory, they, they like to remember the Mao who helped to set up the Chinese Communist Party who uh, resisted the, the Japanese invasion of, of Chinese territory, who fought the, the civil war against the nationalist forces uh, and eventually led the, the, the communist revolution in China in 1949. They're far less keen on the, the Chairman Mao of the 1950s, 60s and 70s. You know, they're, 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 far less, um, they're far less enthusiastic about the Mao, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. Um, and th this statue had to be taken down. Um, the campaign to remove the statue of Cecil Rhodes um, outside Oriel College in Oxford um, should say that, that Cecil Rhodes, I mean, supporters of Cecil Rhodes wanted to keep his memory alive. Um, they used part of the, the fortune that was left by Cecil Rhodes to you know, commission very sympathetic biographies of him, uh, to name public places after him, to have all kinds of memorial plaques about Cecil Rose, but also to give money to the Oxford College where he studied on and off. It kind of comes backwards and forwards between Oxford and South Africa. Um, so a statue was put in place at Oriel College and um, in 2015, a student who had been involved in the protests in Cape Town came across to Oxford to try and start a similar campaign there. And uh, we get some, you know, we get an idea of the, of the kinds of people that are involved in this. There's a lot of overexcited talk in the media about mobs pulling down statues and, and everything else. This isn't really a mob. This is a, it's a peaceful demonstration uh, with, a, with a highly educated uh, female activists with a, with a megaphone, probably probably speaking Latin, to uh, the other the other demonstrators there, and they they try to pull uh, a, a petition together. Something like three thousand signatures are collected for a petition to remove the statue. Oriel College, um, fairly kind of constructive uh, and engaged in the way that they respond to the student protests. They they launch a consultation on the statue's uh, future. There's a there's a a divergence from that um, as far as Oxford University as a whole is concerned. Um, Chris Patton, who was a former Conservative cabinet minister, the, the last British governor of Hong Kong in 1997, um, when it was handed back to Chinese sovereignty, became the Chancellor of Oxford University. And in an interview at the start of 2016, he took a fairly hard line against the Rose Must Fall campaign. Uh, and basically said that if students didn't like the statue there, then they should think about studying at a different university. Um, it also became quite apparent that the that Patton was uh, under some pressure from uh, donors to Oxford University generally and to Oriel in particular. Um, people were saying that if the statue was taken down, they would no longer continue to donate money to Oxford. And there was a figure in the media of maybe a hundred million pounds being at stake. So for all those different reasons, Oriel College announced on the 29th of January, 2016, that the statue would stay in place. Now, of course, since then, events have uh, moved on. Uh, there was the, the killing of George Floyd in America last year. Um, the Black Lives Matter campaign really sprang up in the wake of that. You'd have seen in this country, the statue of Edward Colston was, was pulled down in Bristol and dumped into the harbor. Uh, a statue of Edward Milligan, uh, another slave trader, was taken down by Tower Hamlets Council from its spot outside the uh, Museum of London Docklands Museum uh, at West India Keys. Um, and in the wake of that, Oriel set up uh, an independent commission of inquiry to look again 
uh, the whole roads must fall issue. And they, they, they took the view that certainly in principle, they thought that the, the statute should come down. So um, that uh, commission of inquiry was set up in June 2020. It reported in April of this year. You can have a look at the report if you're interested. It's available online. It's 140 plus pages, uh, lots of detailed comment in there, as you'd expect, and lots of appendices, which, which pretty much uh, provide, uh, you know, a, a kind of very thoughtful history of 19th century Southern Africa and, 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 and Rhodes' connection with all kinds of, all kinds of issues there. Uh, again, they made the recommendation that the statue should come down Nothing has happened since then because, um, well, partly the debate has turned to questions of logistics and practicalities. How do you pull the statue down? Um, what takes its place? Um, how much is it going to cost to actually remove the statue safely? All of that apparently needs to be taken into account. But also, of course, since then, there's been quite a lot of pushback from the current Conservative government, um, in particular led by the Culture Secretary, Oliver Dowden, who um, sees there is political capital to be made in, you know, in quotes, saving our statues and protecting a fairly kind of conservative and traditional interpretation of, of Britain's history and its heritage. Um, now, that's, you know, that, that's a kind of summary of, uh, of some of the, uh, the issues that are involved in there. What we do, of course, with our students is is hear from them. We, we provide materials for them, we give them things to read, we put up film clips for them to, to have a look at, we make some uh, newspaper articles available to our students. They would read those in advance of a kind of seminar discussion, the kind of thing that Stuart was talking about, you know, rather than do great big long lectures to our students on this subject, we'll talk for a little while to frame things up for them, much the way that I have done for, for you just now, but then we make sure they have things to read, they have things to think about, we, we set them some questions that will prompt their thinking, and then we give them a chance to talk to each other, and, and also to talk to us. Um, we, we don't really tell our students what to think, what we try to do is, is, is help them to think clearly and an informed way about aspects of the past and aspects of the way that we commemorate and remember the past. So we, we get a discussion, a debate going with our students. Should we remove statues of people whose past actions are offensive to us? And maybe in class we'd use something like a uh, Mentimeter. So students would kind of get their phones out. Um, being very useful for us uh, this year because some of our teaching has been face to face, but some of it has been online, has been on Zoom. So people can still take part in some of these discussions, even if they're not actually present in the classroom with us. So we would use Mentimeter, people get their phones out, log into Mentimeter, put the code in, then they would vote one way or the other or a kind of third undecided way. This is the, the result of the most recent um, survey that we do with our students. So we had 60% of them thinking that statues should be removed, 40% that statues should stay in place. Um, going on from that, we'd ask our students just to kind of type in a few ideas to explain why they took the view that they did, um, which is a really kind of handy teaching resource. It gives our students a bit of thinking time. We can display the results up on the board and then we can look at the comments and, and, and dive into those a little bit and flesh out some of the ideas that the students had put down. Um, if we were doing this as a proper live session, um, we would have been able to do something like this with you today and actually got you to, to you know, take, a, take a position, to, to register a, a preference and then maybe to type in some comments. But unfortunately, we can't really, we can't really do that. Um, the last thing I would say, just to pick up on uh, what Stuart was saying before, with this module, Public Histories, rather than assess our students through an exam or all through a kind of piece of conventional coursework, the main thing that our students produce um, for this module is an output for an end of module exhibition. Because the module is all about how historical knowledge kind of circulates in the public sphere and it's sometimes mobilised for um, you know, political purposes um, to, to support one side or other in a particular political controversy. Uh, we thought it was a good idea to get our students to work in one of these very kind of public forms. So um, this year we had a couple of students who made um, short films 
um, about, well, I think they made forms about issues around, well, one was around um, kind of refugees and migration. Um, the other one was about statues of comfort women um, in South Korea. Fantastic films. We had a student who produced a really good podcast. We had a couple of students work together to produce uh, a museum exhibition, a set of uh, kind of museum information boards, texts and images um, about um, uh, representatives, the wrong word, but members isn't really the great word either, but people who we, we might kind of position within um, the black LGBTQ plus communities in Britain. That was really, really good. Um, We've had students that have produced uh, blogs for this. We had a student who produced uh, a walking tour of uh, parts of London, you know, stopping off at various uh, monuments and, uh, you know, sites of particular historical importance and saying something uh, about those, uh, which are all really effective. We also had a student who produced uh, a design for, uh, for a new memorial in London. So it had a design, it had some inscriptions, and it had a set of arguments for why the memorial should be cited in the intended space and you know where we might be able to find some support to actually get the the, the statue installed and and built and how the funds could be raised so a real chance to think creatively and then that is accompanied by uh, a more conventional piece of academic writing positioning the exhibition output within a, a wider set of discussions and debates and scholarly writing about public history memory and commemoration. So the kind of work that the students do draws on the reading that we do in the seminar. So um, just going to stop the share there. That was just a very quick kind of taster really of the kind of work that we do with our students and the kind of materials that we use. Uh, what I'm going to do now, uh, if he's listening carefully, is to hand back to Stuart, who I think he was saying he was going to put up um, just our email addresses again. So if there's anything you want to find out about what we do at St Mary's and the kind of um, uh, the courses that we teach and what other things you can do with history, uh, please do get in touch and we will we will get back to you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Mark. And here are our email addresses. Um, and with that, thank you very much for listening. Um, as Mark says, if you do have anything that you want to ask us, please do get in touch.